It's been time. It is really good to have all of you here with me today. It was August 7, 2015, when I first visited Julian Holgen at his Finca Immaculata in Colombia. Now Julian took us up to this little house up on the mountain in amongst the coffee trees. And there was this long wooden table and a cupping session. And I remember this coffee it was in the middle of the table, unlike anything I've tried before. And as I tasted it, it was unbelievably sweet. It reminded me of stevia sweetener, which has this clean, refined sweetness similar to icing sugar. But the second time around the table, this coffee had completely changed. It turned savory and vegetal. But I knew that sweetness and gentle acidity were the bones for incredible espresso. So I had to know more about this coffee. And I found out it was one of the first non-Arabica species that I'd ever tried. It was Caffea euhonoides. As you can see at the bottom there, this is just one of 124 different coffee species. Now, can you imagine a cupping table with 124 species on it? Well, I've learned that these coffees aren't the kind of coffees you just cup and they're amazing straight away. I had to open up my mind, dig deep to find true potential in Euhonoides. Now I wondered for a long time why Euhonoides cooled the way it did, which led me to microbiologists from Christian Hansen in Denmark, who helped me work with Julian to dramatically transform Euhonoides flavor profile. And I'll tell you all about that a little later on. But first, you'll notice I have these frozen metal rocks on my vessels for my signature drink. I'll explain why during the espresso course. Now I'm running these shots first because I want to give you the best balance of flavor in the espresso course. But before we go into any more technical information, I'd love to just give us a bit of time to settle in. And welcome to my coffee bar. These little black glasses are for your used teaspoons. And I cannot wait to serve to you some coffee species for the third time. So let's start off with the espresso and a technique I developed with Zurich University of Applied Science to brighten Euhonoides flavor profile. I call this compound chilling. And if you're wondering what that is, it's on your booklets there in front. On the left hand side of your booklet, you'll see normal espresso with really hot liquid traveling through the air. You'll also see at the bottom of your booklet we lose a lot of aroma volatile compounds. So on the right of your booklet, you'll see compound chilling. The espresso is pouring straight over frozen metal blocks. Now I chose to rapidly chill the first 12 grams of the espresso. The portion where Euhonoides gives the majority of fruity volatile compounds. And with this method, we've measured up to 40% more of some of these compounds. The effect on Euhonoides is like walking into a dark room, turning the lights on. You're gonna taste this pink guava note, so distinct. You just this fragrant of the espresso. So for the espresso, I'll get you to write down a few tasting notes. Today you'll taste pink guava, pineapple, passion fruit, and stevia like the sweetener. It's just above medium weight. The texture of a simple sugar syrup. It's also coating. It has a long, sweet finish with the sensation of eating a fresh white grape. Now, please take three sips of this espresso. Get really comfortable with that level of sweetness. There we go. Now, I have never tasted anything like it. I'm so glad I didn't spill any, because this is for you. There we go, enjoy it. That's for you. Enjoy. 
lucky last. Thank you so much. Enjoy it. I'll give you about 15 seconds more with that espresso. All right, how did you go with that sweetness? Well, this espresso took me three years to bring you this experience. So, in, in my signature drink, I'd love to dive even deeper into the layers of this coffee, bring out even more potential for you. Those savory notes and vegetal qualities I tasted on the cupping table, they've come from euhenoides, microbes in the fermentation. So I connected with microbiologists from Christian Hansen in Denmark, who helped me to solve this problem. So we selected a species of non-saccharomyces yeast that's naturally occurring and proven to produce a lot of these fruity esters. So I flew over to Columbia. I added the yeast to a sealed tank of eucanoidus cherries. We put it underneath the house at the mill at 18 degrees, pushing that fermentation in the direction that I wanted. Now I remember opening that tank at six days and it smelled unbelievable. It was like pure tropical fruit punch. Absolutely no distractions. This is a unique aroma. So for this, I have these galaxy hops that are used in beer brewing. This smells amazing, just like my tropical espresso but it has savory tannins and bitter notes that I wanted to avoid. So I needed a technique to remove these negatives and just highlight the potential of this ingredient, just like we've done in your espresso. So I've used this distilling technique with 10% of hops, 90% of water, to distill off these beautiful aromatic compounds with no savory tannins. Now I found when I add 12 mil of these hops to four shots of my espresso, will highlight these new orange citrus characters in the signature drink. Okay, next. I have 96 degree water. I'm pouring onto tinned pineapple syrup, releasing its aroma volatile compounds into the atmosphere. Now this is just like normal espresso. Hot espresso liquid, releasing all of its volatiles. But today, we are not gonna waste these. The big headspace of these glasses will capture them for the drink. And this will bring more of a candy note to that pineapple in the espresso. So now we've boosted flavor. I want to work with Yuhanoid's strength, its tactile and taste balance. So first, I'm adding a frozen metal rock to chill the drink to 23 degrees without dilution. This will bring out this juicy acidity that's so high quality. This is coming from that incredible fermentation. And to balance this, I have fructose, which has a really clean and fruity sweetness. That was the only sugar source that I found didn't close down those fruit characters in my espresso. So I'm making a one-to-one -one simple syrup. And I found when I add three mil, we actually opened up these new flavors in the espresso of white peach. So I'm adding three mil. So next, I'm charging the entire drink with NO2 to evolve that syrupy texture into something that reminds me of whipped cream. So when you're ready, take a look at the booklets. You'll see all your drinking instructions and tasting notes right there in front. Now, I want you to have this drink to best enjoy in two sips. Before your first sip, I get you to swirl five times, smell and taste. And if you could write down, 
candy pineapple. Whipped cream texture. White peach. And orange marmalade. Coming through with that beautiful, juicy acidity. I love that part of this drink. All right, now it's time. Enjoy it. There we go. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. That's the last time. Enjoy it. Thanks, guys. Give you about 15 seconds more. Okay, when you're ready. For the milk course, you have all tasting notes and drinking instructions right there in front. And if you could please write down, stir five times. Take three sips to enhance my version of banoffee pie. So for me, this is ripe banana, caramel, whipped cream, and fruity dark chocolate. Imagine it's grated on top. And you'll also taste flambe brandy. This is when you light the brandy on fire. Right. So you'll notice I extracted these shots five minutes ago. I'm serving at 54 degrees. I'll get you to hold off from tasting until the very end. Just visually assess for now, as this will give you more of that banoffee pie in your third sip. So when you're ready, have a sip of water, rinse the palate, and we'll continue on together. Now, Euhonoidus has these delicate tropical fruits that are easily lost in the fats and sugars of the milk. So I wanted a lot more power and persistence of these fruit flavors. So I went back we go, to this big world of coffee species. Again, just holding up for now, thank you. It's where I found exactly what I needed in Caffea liberica, growing in Malaysia. And I blended this 50% with Euhonoidus. And this works for two main reasons. First, on your booklets there in front, on the left-hand side, you'll see that Euhonoidus cherry. It has a really thin sugar layer on the parchment. But you'll also see, next to it, the Liberica cherry. It's much thicker. It's more sugar for those microorganisms to grow. Now, this means also that we have these big, thick skin that protects those sugars from byproducts in a long 30-day fermentation, giving that intense banana note with no distractions. Now, the next reason is both these coffees have low chlorogenic acid, which is a harsh and sharp acid. We usually need to roast a coffee longer time to break down the milk base. But because these species have low chlorogenic acid, we could roast these coffees really quickly with only 8% development. And it also means that we can balance these flavors with only 45 grams of milk. So that's more flavor in every sip. Again, just holding off. Now, I worked with Jason Liu from My Liberica in Malaysia on this particular lot. And he told me, Liberica is a declining industry. We've all overlooked this coffee for such a long time. But after tasting this lot, our chats are just positives for the future. If I hadn't believed in the positives of Euhonoidus or Liberica, I could not have brought you these coffees. And to think, 
there is 124 or more coffee species that are still out there. They're often unprotected and could just disappear. This tells me one thing. Our time is right now to discover these coffees, bring out their potential, enjoy them together, just as you're about to do. So I cannot wait for you to have this milk coffee. This has been so much fun. Stir to the bottom five times. Enjoy those wonderful flavors. Thank you so much. That's my time. Give it up for the competitor from Australia, Hugh Kelly.